Is it a secret that I have a love-hate relationship with the Huga clan? Let me be frank, the Huga clan is one of the coolest clans in all of Naruto. Their beautiful white Byakugan, total chakra control, and perhaps the coolest taijutsu style in all of the series. While I still prefer the Sharingan to the Byakugan in almost every capacity, the Byakugan's visual prowess is second to none. Being more observant than even the Uchiha, though Sasuke's abilities displayed in the movie Bonds, in which he emulates the gentle fist to defeat Dr. Shino, might be an outlier, they naturally see far better than other users of Dojutsu, and their ability to control chakra from every point in their body makes them the scalpels in Konoha's box of blunt instruments. Cold and logical, they stand as the direct opposite of the Uchiha. Where the Uchiha favored clan over village, the Hyuga believed their clan should be willing to die for Konoha. Where loyalty to their clansmen and love of equality were in the personality traits of the Uchiha, the Hyuga cared very little for their own family members and had a strict and cruel caste system within their clan to ensure everyone had their jobs and that the abilities of their clan would remain forever unknown to all. That's why, despite the Byakugan being basically useless to anyone who isn't a Hyuga, it's still highly sought after, a greed that has nearly thrown the world into chaos time and time again. That's where I heavily disagree with the Hyuga. The Uchiha did some nasty stuff, and their desire to overthrow the village likely had them earn their downfall, though one could understand their point of view. But despite these differences, when I look at the Uchiha, I see a tightly knit family that simply wants to be accepted and loved the way they accept and love the others. The Hyuga, on the other hand, I can't stand because their cruel treatment of their own family members, their own brothers, sisters, and cousins has left a bad taste in my mouth, nearly to the point where I detest them in a Neji-style fashion. They also had character growth through the series, and I will give credit where credit is due, but the fundamental problems in their lifestyle and their treatment of others has left me believing that the Hyuga have not taken due stock of their priorities, nor were they filled with much love for anyone. The only thing they share in common with the Uchiha is an intense pride that, while drawn from very different sources, burns as white-hot as their lifeless eyes that have the ability to see anything but the truth. And so, due to the fact that they're essentially the polar opposites of the Uchiha clan, I can't help but wonder, what if the Hyuga fell instead? Welcome to the Amagi. Before we begin, we publish a new video every day, so be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. We've also noticed that a lot of folks who watch our videos aren't actually subscribed to our channel. We get it, YouTube does do a very good job of getting you what you want to watch, but if you want to ensure that you never miss a video, and if you just want to support us, make sure you hit that subscribe button. Thanks so much! The Amagi's reach stretches beyond just this channel, so if you're a fan of us, please consider subscribing to our other channels and following us on all of our social media. Help us reach our goal of passing 100,000 followers on all of our accounts by the end of the year. Before I begin, I need to say something. I'm going to change a few things to help the story work better. First off, I'm going to make Neji the same age as the canonical Itachi to help better maintain the timeline. But I'm not pulling these years out of thin air. I plan to, in return, kidify Itachi so that he would be about the age canonical Neji was. Basically, they're switching birthdays. In this way, I plan to make Itachi and Sasuke twins because that's just flat out adorable. And now, without further ado, let's get into the story. The night was silent. The crickets had stopped their song. No lanterns or candles could be seen, no lights in the buildings. Despite this, the dead silent night was illuminated by the full moon, the eye of Hamada gazing down upon this, seeing all, a halo of ice crystals encircling it in the sky like frozen tears drifting in the empty void. Neji looked up at the moon and took a breath. Was this relief? A sigh of dull emotion? Or perhaps he was merely attempting to catch his breath? What was it? Why was he out of breath? He thought back. In his mind's eye, he replayed the events leading up to this moment. The Hyuga Affair, or so it was called, was what happened when a filthy Kumonin under the guise of an olive branch attempted to kidnap Hinata and take from her the Byakugan. Hiyashi had done what any father could have and should have done. He killed the bastard. To that, Neji gave Hiyashi credit. There was not anything wrong with what Hiyashi had done in defending his daughter, and if he had been so caring of all of his family, Neji would not have felt as he did now. But what happened next? That was unforgivable. Hiyashi, having killed the shinobi, was now the target of Kumo's ire. Kumo and Konoha were at war, and this was their last chance at peace. But it was a peace that should be built on trust, and Kumo had broken that trust first. 
It was Neji's opinion that Konoha bring all the power they had to bear and drop it on the accursed village hidden in the clouds. But no, Konoha and the Hyuga didn't desire that. In their spineless natures, they decided it was best to appease Kumo. They knew what Kumo had done and what they wanted, and they were nearly ready to give it to them. But the issue with this was that Hiyashi refused to take responsibility for his actions. Kumo wanted Hiyashi dead, but Hiyashi didn't wish to die, so what's a rotten clan head to do? Perhaps he should pass it off on someone else. It just so happened that Hiyashi had a brother, a twin, one who was merely seconds younger than him. The man's name was Hizashi, and he was Neji's father. It was decided by Hiyashi, as well as the elder, the man who just so happened to be Hiyashi and Hizashi's father, that it would be best to kill Hizashi and send him to the village hidden in the clouds. And that's exactly what they did. Neji's father had taken the rap for his brother and was killed against his will for the sake of the village and clan. Ten lousy damn seconds. That was all that stood in the way of Neji and his father being main branch members. And if such a thing had been so, no doubt this would not have happened but it was now too late to cry over spilt milk. Neji boiled over this. More than once, his anger overtook him and he would say something snide or even nearly come to blows with his uncle and grandfather, and every time they would resort to the seal on his forehead to pacify him. Such a helpless feeling, so crushing. To be stuck, feeling a hatred that refuses to abate until paid for in blood, yet unable to satisfy it because of a cruel mark that bound you forever as a slave to the people who murdered your own father people who were supposed to be your family. How many times had he drawn blood from his lip, biting it so hard as he saw the main branch family walk by? They'd caused so much suffering. In a world where he already lacked his freedom, they pushed more suffering upon him to simply make their lives even easier than they already were. Caught in despair, Neji had for a time considered ending his own life, throwing himself into the Naka River. After all, in his eyes, it was better to die free than to live a slave. It was there, however, that he met a man with a swirling mask. Who was he? Neji did not know. All he knew him as was Ghost. The man spoke to Neji and told him that he also had a grudge against the Hyuga. The main branch flaunted its power over the secondary branch, and the secondary branch remained silent. Perhaps there was nothing they could do, but to so easily resign themselves to such a life was pitiful. This ghost told Neji that they needed to scrape away any connection to the past. They needed to rebuild the clan from the ground up, and further needed to rework the way the world worked if they wanted to ensure that nobody ever had to suffer the same way ever again. Despite this, Neji didn't feel as if he could agree to this. He told the masked man that he was branded with the cursed seal of the caged bird, and because of this, he was unable to do anything against his clan. The masked man would scoff at this and tell him it was trivial. Reaching his hand up, he released the seal on Neji's head. Neji wondered how this man could so easily remove the curse mark placed by the elders of the Hyuga. The man stood there silent for a moment as Neji's mind tried to understand what just happened. How does it feel, Neji, to be truly free? The cage opened, the bird allowed to soar. Neji was almost moved to tears by this. I'm free. Ghost's single, visible eye narrowed. And what do you want with this freedom? Neji looked up. I want to expunge the main branch from existence. I want them to suffer. Then, maybe, they can feel a hint of pain, even a single iota of what I felt. Ghost would clap his hands. Then we are in agreement, blood for blood, lives for lives. We will end the tyrannical reign of the main branch. And then we will offer the freedom of death to the blinded secondary branch members. And so, Neji and the Ghost made their way back to the Hyuga clan compound. There, Neji wasted no time making his way toward the main branch's home, his eyes full of bloodlust, his heart beating to the sound of the drums of war. Ghost split off from Neji and made his way to the main living area of the secondary branch, leaving Hiyashi and the others to Neji, knowing in his prodigious nature Neji could handle them just fine. Neji made his way into the building. There, he was met by Natsu Hyuga, who was surprised to see him arrive so late. He looked to her, his veins bulging in his temples. Natsu was filled with a sudden sense of dread and horror. Before she could say a word, a blade was dragged across his stomach, carving through flesh and organ alike. Startled, she fell back, blood beginning to trickle from her lips. He walked on, leaving her to her fate. His blade dripping as he walked deeper, he opened the door to the main living quarters where both Hiyashi and the elders stood. They turned to look at him, surprised at his appearance so late in the night. Neji, why have you intruded upon our private conversation? The elder asked, crossing his arms, waiting for what he hoped would be a damn good explanation. Why are you carrying a blade, and why is it bloody? 
Neji closed the door behind him as he stepped into the light. Lowering his hood, he let up a smile. How many years have I waited for this? How many years have I dreamt of this? Now the moment is here, and I don't know which of my fantasies to live through. He took a step forward, his steps increasing in speed into nearly a sprint. The elder was shocked. Neji stepped into the swing like a batter aiming for a home run. However, instead of holding a bat, it was a katana, and instead of a baseball, it was one grouchy old man's worthless head. His blade made contact with the elder's neck, cleaving it from his body. Hiyashi was in total shock. He was so startled by this that he nearly forgot what to do. He raised his fingers to activate the curse mark in hopes of completely frying the nerve endings in Neji's brain. Neji laughed at this, removing his forehead protector to show that there was no curse mark. Hiyashi was startled by this. Neji touched the tip of the blade to Hiyashi's chest. Do me a favor, and I may spare your youngest daughter. Say his name. Hiyashi was confused. What? Neji's smile turned into a furious snarl as he kicked Hiyashi in the face. My father! The man you had murdered in your place! Say his name! I want it to be the last thing on your lips before I send you to hell! Hiyashi was wiping the blood from his nose. Hizashi! Neji would press the blade through his heart. Twisting it a little, he pulled the blade back and walked on, finding Hinata's room where she lay in bed sleeping. At the other end of the room was a crib containing Hanabi. Neji stepped up to Hinata as she awakened to see him. She screamed out as if he were a monster, seeing him covered in blood. He spoke. I should have been you. He raised his blade to strike her down, respectful of her, her youth and innocence subverting his just vengeance. He wanted it to be over quickly for her so she wouldn't suffer. His blade still dripping, he looked down on her and found himself taken out of his own head for but a moment, realizing what he had just done to the girl he had sworn to give his life for. What had he done? He shook his head to snap out of it. Justice. It was justice. I shouldn't have even been forced into her service to start with. Coming back to himself, he heard crying. Walking to the crib, he looked in at the child, Hanabe. Merely two years old, barely old enough to talk, barely old enough to remember anything. If the Hyuga's innocence could be condensed and personified, Hanabi was currently that. Despite his contempt for her family, he was still shaken by the murder of Hinata. He couldn't have killed her if he wanted to, but that being said, he had also given his word that he would spare her if Hiyashi had said the name of his father as he died, and Hiyashi had. Neji flicked his blade through the air, splattering blood onto the tatami carpet below. He then returned it to its saya. Looking at the crying baby as it looked up to him in terror as if seeing the monster under its bed manifest under the light of the moon. He placed his hand over Hanabi's mouth and raised a finger to his own. Hanabi, in terror, would begin to hiccup, yet somehow managing to hold back from wailing. Neji turned and left. He left the building back into the night where blood ran from every door like a river. From one of the homes came the ghost, his body littered with at least five different katanas, yet he strode about as if they meant nothing like he were a porcupine paying no mind to its quills. He approached Neji as he slowly started pulling the blades and tossing them to the ground, regenerating nearly immediately afterward. You sure took long enough, the man said, looking at the blood and the half-cocked smile. Seems you enjoyed yourself. A bit too much, perhaps. Neji grit his teeth. The fools got what they deserved. My only regret was that I didn't make them suffer more. The ghost stared silently at him. It was hard to gauge what this masked man was thinking, though it likely ranged from anywhere between disgust to pride in this boy's statement. The masked man, having removed every sword from his body, turned to leave. Neji called out to him. Where are you going? The man looked back. Can't stay here, can we? We just committed an act of genocide. Konoha's gonna come through here eventually, and when they do, they're gonna be pissed. I don't think either of us should be here when that happens, wouldn't you agree? Neji did agree. His life in Konoha was over. Wherever he set down roots, wherever he recreated the Hyuga clan, it wouldn't be here. He was about to have the highest bounty in Konoha's bingo book. The single most influential clan besides the Uchiha had just been massacred, and it was Neji who had done it. And so he left the village with this masked man. But to his surprise, when it came time, or so Neji had expected for the two to part, the masked man instead invited him to join his plan. Plan? Neji asked. What plan? The masked man raised a finger to his cheekbone, mocking a pondering face. The step to our revenge. Total destruction of Kumogakure. Wouldn't you like to see that village that killed your father burn? Neji scoffed a laugh and looked away as if assuming this were a joke. But something in him knew that this man was serious, and even worse, his mind began to wonder if he could do it. He looked back at the man. It would be a dream. But like most of the fantasies I have as I go to sleep, it's impossible. The man smiled with his eyes. Wasn't the destruction of the Hyuga clan an impossible dream? 
Neji considered it and decided to take the bait. All right, I'll bite. How do you plan to do this? The man found a place to rest. He needed to focus on what he was going to say, how best to articulate his plan to Neji, and he needed Neji to focus on his words. He then began to explain, the moon. Neji stood there and looked up at it, the moon. The man nodded, we are going to drop it on Kumo and every other hidden village. We're going to wipe out the entire Shinobi world at once, alongside its darkness. Neji laughed, the moon, we're gonna drop the moon. He laughed harder and then wiped the tears from his eyes, but then he grew more serious. And how do you expect to drop the moon on the shinobi villages? The man did not seem pleased that he was being joked about, but he swallowed his pride. After all, who wouldn't laugh at a plan that sounded so crazy? This was why he had to stop in the first place, knowing that his plan would require him to explain how one could control the moon. He began to speak. Neji, do you know about the origins of the Byakugan? Do you know where your eye comes from? Neji thought about it for a moment. Mutation? Likely a similar case to all dojutsu. You're both right and wrong. Wrong in saying that it's merely a mutation, and right in saying that its origins tie into all dojutsu. The Sharingan, the Ketsuryugan, the Byakugan. These are but a few of the possibilities that exist, and among humans, the Sharingan and Byakugan are the most plentiful. But they were not a symbol of mutation or adaptation. No, they're all inherited from a distant clan of celestial beings from which the Sage of Six Paths is descended. Neji was starting to stutter and stumble in disbelief, and then it kicked in. Another smile. He didn't believe him. How could he? Talk of celestial beings? The Sage of Six Paths? The Sage was a myth. He did not exist and was created by Shinobi to embody the will of fire and what it meant to be enlightened. You plan to destroy the Shinobi world with a bedtime story. The man shook his head. No. It is real, and I can prove it. Neji once more took the bait. He stood and followed the man who led him deeper. Through here, he said as they passed into a cave. The man spoke. There are many such caves as this. Doorways through space and time. And if one knows where they are, one may travel anywhere, at any time. And they all share a single nexus. One place. One place where all roads meet. A singularity point. He led him in, and the two slowly found themselves falling. Rushing down through what felt like water, they eventually found themselves ascending. Coming up through another cave, they found themselves in an ancient city. A city that contained the lore of the occurrence of Chakra, the origin of modern society descended from ancient times. But this was not what the man wanted to show him. No, he led him out of the city and up toward the surface. There, stepping out onto the white ground, Neji witnessed it for the first time, the hovering earth in the ethereal darkness. Where... Are we? He asked with a hint of frantic disbelief in his voice. The man held his arms out wide and turned in a circle. This is the moon. Neji looked around. How did you find this place? The man began walking again, leading him toward a lone structure on the white dusted rock. It was by chance that I found this place. But then again, karma must be equaled and this is my due return. He led Neji inside. The Uchiha believed that they were the only ones with a stone monument. Not so. He showed them a stone slab within the structure, a castle dusty and in disrepair. This stone can only be read by one possessing the blood of Hamura strongly, those of the Hyuga who possess a Byakugan. This speaks of a forgotten dojutsu from which all Byakugan were descended, the legendary and mythical Tensaigon, a dojutsu whose abilities surpass even that of the Rinnegan. With it, gravitational forces, the will of the universe, fate itself will be ours to command, life and death, rebirth, and that is what I hope to bring to the world. Rebirth. Let the former world pass away. Euthanize the sick dog so it may be reborn anew. A world without war, without pain, without shinobi. A world where all are truly free to follow their own path. Neji stood there and looked at it. Why did you approach me? The man looked back. I sought a partner. Someone who shared my ideals and you were the perfect choice. Neji continued to stare at him, his eyes remaining doubtful. You could have taken any of the Hyuga. Why did you choose me specifically? Or let me rephrase, what were you doing at the Naka River that day when I was about to throw myself off the cliff? The man stood there silently. Neji followed this up with one final, very important question. Who are you? The man blinked silently for a moment. Finally, he took a breath in the form of a sigh as if he were attempting to decide whether or not to speak. Neji then decided for him. If you really want me to help you, then you need me to trust you. And you're never going to get me to trust you so long as you hide your identity. Who are you? The man looked up at him with a click of his tongue. 
Slowly, he undid the strap holding his mask on. He removed the mask from his face to show none other than the face of Hizashi Hyuga himself. Neji was startled by this. Father, no, impossible, he was killed. Neji pulled a blade. I don't know who you are, but if you're using the face of my father as some twisted joke, I'll kill you just as I did the others. Hizashi smiled. It truly is me, my son. Do you remember the day you were branded with the cursed seal? Do you remember what happened? Neji nodded. Hizashi continued. I maintained my composure before going home with you where I locked myself away in my room and cried. My contempt for the clan solidified that day, and the day my life was taken from me, I remembered only you. Your face was the last on my mind as I perished. It is indeed me. Neji's grip on his katana intensified, though his stance slightly relaxed. How? Hizashi stood there and looked around as if deep in thought himself. Rebirth, my son. Neji took a step forward, his stance growing a bit more combat-oriented. No, no more riddles. You owe me an answer. Hizashi sighed once more. I suppose I do. He sat down. The day I was killed, I saw my life flash before my eyes. From what I surmise, my body truly was delivered to Kumo. But at that time, my Byakugan were already sealed, so they were of no use to Kumo. Whatever happened after that is a mystery to me. I was in the land of the dead. I saw old friends, allies from my time in the Third Shinobi World War. I thought I had found some sort of peace, but as I was starting to get settled, a chain from the lower world wrapped around me and began to pull me back. Unable to resist, I awakened. The state of my body was not what it had been. I felt dirty, sinful, like an abomination, an affront to nature, and that's exactly what I am. An impure reincarnation, closer to a half-resurrection. How did you come back? Neji asked. Hizashi raised his hand to explain that he was getting to that. I awakened and saw a snake. Neji grimaced. Orochimaru. Hizashi further explained his story. I awakened, that snake of a man standing over me. He stated that he had rediscovered the second Hokage's crown jewel, his biggest achievement in ninjutsu, a forbidden technique to which none were allowed to use after its development. The impure world reincarnation jutsu. You see, with special commands achieved through sealing formulas and one's own chakra, they can take a living soul and overwrite their genetic structure, as well as their spirit with one of the deceased, so long as the catcher possesses some direct DNA from the one they wish to reincarnate. With this method, Orochimaru gave me new life. But this life was not one without cost. Once again, I was a slave. Orochimaru's grip over me was tight, and I found myself only holding on because of my compliance. You see, he had the ability to suppress my consciousness the moment I stepped out of line, and so my only options were to follow his orders or have my mind reduced to a mere shell. Neji by this time had taken a seat. Then how did you get away? Hizashi smiled. Karma. Good karma. Having suffered in life as much as I had, I was due for good things to happen to me. It just so happened that I discovered the hand signs Orochimaru used to control me. A situation that should have been impossible when considering how conscientious Orochimaru is. But I managed to free myself from his grasp. The chains were broken, but I didn't run away. Not yet. I played my part further, getting information on current world events, information on various projects, and anything else I could get my hands on. And when I no longer needed Orochimaru, I simply snuck up behind him and killed him. He never expected it. He never saw it coming. From there, I snuck out and went into hiding. Nobody could know that I was still alive, not if I planned to get my revenge. It was by chance that the cave I decided to hide in possessed a secret portal that led here, and it was from here that I learned of the Hyuga's origins, the origins of our Byakugan, and the primal reversion that allows us to gain more power by returning to the root of our dojutsu. The moment I learned these things, a plan began to form, and it was you that I needed for that plan. It was good that I kept my eyes on you. If I had not, you would not be here today. Neji stood there and clicked his katana back into place, locking it down. So, does this mean you're alive or dead? The wounds you shrugged off would kill any normal person. Hizashi looked at his hands, cracks running through them, through his face and body. His sclera were dark as midnight, causing his Byakugan to come across as simply a pair of white orbs floating in a void set within his head. I don't know the answer to that question, but considering what I feel deep within my soul, I believe I'm neither. I'm neither living nor dead. I'm undead, tethered to this existence simply by my grudge against the shinobi world. My reason for living is to see this unfair, unjust world burn, and from those ashes, a new world will be reborn. A world where my son sits upon a throne, 
his unending potential laid bare for all to see. The Ten Saigon, Neji said. Hizashi smiled. Yes, the Ten Saigon. Your Ten Saigon. Neji smirked. What do we need to accomplish this? Hizashi stood once more. We need but two things. Chakra from a set of reincarnations. The reincarnations of Indra and Ashura Otsotsuki. Neji stood there silent for a moment before speaking. Fair. Now tell me, who are these reincarnations? Naruto and Sasuke were racing through the forest together. The two boys had been close since birth, and that was mostly because Fugaku and Makoto Uchiha had basically adopted him. Their house was full, as was their hearts. Three boys, all about the same age. As rough as that seemed, knowing how rowdy boys can be, it wasn't really that bad. These boys were mostly low maintenance because they had the others to play with, and therefore they left Fugaku alone to do his work. But on occasions, every so often, Fugaku would leave his office for the nearby forests, where he would round the boys up for a rousing game of tag. But the kind of tag they played was closer to a shinobi sparring session. This meant cheating to a point was allowed. The only rule that Fugaku expected them to follow was, if you're tagged, you're out. And right now, Fugaku was on their tails. His Sharingan active. He had an unfair advantage of size, strength, and ability over them in a way that seemed nearly hopeless for them. But this was exactly what they needed. You didn't grow if all you did was succeed. Sometimes they would play survival tag, and the winner wasn't decided by who didn't get tagged, but by the one who was the last to get tagged. But it wasn't only the kids who needed training, but Fugaku himself so sometimes he would add an extra stipulation. If you make it to the door of the Naka Shrine, you will have beaten me. And right now, every boy was running like their life depended on it toward the Naka Shrine. And in the sense of imagination, their life did depend on it, because in each of their minds, they believed themselves to be in the Third Shinobi World War. Rushing back to base with hidden intel on enemy encampments or some super weapon that would turn the tide. Fugaku kept chasing them, moving from tree to tree. Sasuke looked over his shoulder and saw Fugaku, He's coming, he shouted. To his right was Naruto, who was younger than Sasuke by just a few months, and to his left was his twin brother Itachi, who was older by four minutes. Sasuke then spoke to them. Peel off, we have the number advantage. He can't chase all three of us at once. Naruto nodded and Itachi did as well. The two boys went in completely separate directions. Sasuke, however, continued to run straight. Without so much as slowing down, Fugaku kept up the chase, his eyes already set on Sasuke. He continued to jump through the tree limbs. Fugaku was catching up. Sasuke knew he couldn't outrun his father like this. He may have been lighter, but his legs were smaller, which meant the gait of his stride was much smaller. He only had one chance to get away. As Fugaku got close, Sasuke leapt lightly and instead gripped the next limb loosely with his fingers and swung from it into another tree's trunk, where he pushed off of it and hit the ground rolling before he suddenly rose to his feet and began rushing in the direct opposite direction. He knew that it would take far longer for his father to turn around and catch up, and this decision caught Fugaku by surprise. Damn, he's getting good. But the issue with this was that Sasuke forgot that his father knew the multi-shadow clone jutsu. He realized too late that the Fugaku who had been chasing him was a clone. Suddenly, a set of kunai flew from a bush. Sasuke saw them, but it was too late, and he was pinned to the nearest tree trunk by the kunai and his own sleeves. Opening his eyes, he saw Fugaku approach. You're too late, Sasuke shouted with a sly smile. We're gonna get away. Fugaku smiled at his son. Are you so sure? Fugaku approached his son. Time to see if you have the true shinobi medal to keep your base's location secret after a little advanced interrogation. Sasuke gulped as Fugaku raised his sleeves. Fingers going straight to the ribs, he tickled Sasuke as hard as he could. Naruto was running when he suddenly heard Sasuke's voice from the forest behind him rising over the treetops. Scaring away the birds, he sighed and made the sign of the cross. My poor brother in arms, rest in spaghetti, never forgetty. I'll remember your sacrifice. He then made his way to a secret treehouse that was created for just such an occasion. There, he met up with Itachi. Sasuke has fallen. The mission rests on us now, Naruto said. Itachi pulled out a map, obviously taking this game way too seriously. He pointed to a red X. This is us. He then pointed to a red circle on the map. And this is the Naka Shrine. If we take this path right here, we should be able to sneak by without being seen. Naruto looked at the map and shook his head. No, that's too roundabout. It'll take forever to get there, and time is of the essence. I think we should take this path. It's straighter. Itachi shook his head. No, we can't take that one. It goes straight through an open field. It's the most obvious choice for us to take. Fugaku then pointed to a place on the map. You should take this path here. It's a ravine and has plenty of cover. Naruto nodded. Yeah, that's perfect. He gave Fugaku a high five. Suddenly, Naruto realized what had happened. Damn it, I've been tagged. Fugaku ruffled Naruto's hair a bit. 
You did a lot better this time, Naruto. You'll have me one of these days, I just know it. Fugaku then took off after Itachi, who had left the moment Fugaku entered the room. Itachi was by far the fastest of the bunch, and keeping up with him was a real chore. How do those tiny legs move so fast? Fugaku asked as he watched Itachi move. Itachi jumped from one limb to the next, and as he did, he spun in a circle and threw off a set of shuriken. 360 no scope, he shouted as his shuriken hit the tree limb, snapping as soon as Fugaku stepped on it, causing him to fall. Fugaku hit the ground hard. He sat up and rubbed the back of his neck. All right, shit's on now, Fugaku said as he activated his Mongekyo Sharingan. He began chasing after Itachi again. Itachi kept running. He saw it. It was right there. All he had to do was get to it. He hit the clearing and began running across the stone toward the Naka Shrine's door. Suddenly, a kunai struck the ground in front of him and he tripped on it. Hitting the ground, he looked back and saw it and just then made eye contact with Fugaku. Itachi frantically started crawling toward the door. I just gotta touch it. He reached out as far as he could and at that moment, the game was over. Fugaku knelt there, gripping Itachi's ankles as Itachi's hand was six inches short of the door. Fugaku smiled. Tag, you're it. Itachi's heart shattered. I, I would have won. I would have made it. Fugaku stood and clicked his tongue with a smile. Woulda, coulda, shoulda. On the battlefield, a hair's width is the difference between life and death, and you just died, buddy boy. Fugaku grinned. He opened his right eye to peek at Itachi, who was still laying there. There was the sound of light sobbing. Suddenly, Fugaku's sweet victory turned a little bitter as he realized that he had got a little too competitive with his seven-year-old son. He pulled Itachi up to his feet and sat him on his rear, noticing that he had scraped up his knees when he tripped. Suddenly, Fugaku felt like his number one dad mug was smashed. He pulled Itachi's hair from his face and spoke. You know, this is the furthest you've ever made it. And honestly, this is the first time I've ever had to resort to my Mangekyo just to beat you. Honestly, if I were even one second shorter, then I would have been beaten by you. That's impressive. Itachi still seemed a little upset. Fugaku put his hand on his shoulder. Itachi? The boy looked up, his large eyes overflowing with tears. Fugaku smiled. I am proud of you. So much. You're far stronger than I would have ever expected. And that 360 no-scope thing you did? Style points. I couldn't have ever asked for better kids. Honestly, I see so much of myself in you, but I see so much more potential than I have. One of these days, I'll be the one who can't make it to the Naka Shrine while you chase me. And when that day comes, I'll let you rub it in my face as much as you want, okay? Now, come on, let's get home. He helped Itachi stand. Together, the two of them walked back home, meeting up with Sasuke and Naruto. They saw Fugaku and Itachi coming, and they ran over to him. Itachi, did you do it? Did you get away? Itachi smiled to hide his disappointment. No, I didn't. I was... I was caught a half foot from the door. Naruto's eyes lit up. Cool, that's a new record. Sasuke was impressed too. A half foot, that's basically a victory. Fugaku smiled. It would have been if I hadn't used my Mangekyo. Naruto and Sasuke both looked even more awestruck. Your secret jutsu, Naruto shouted. That says a lot if you had to break that out with just us, Sasuke said. Fugaku laughed. Yep, it means you boys are really getting strong. Probably in the next year, you'll all beat me to the Naka Shrine. It was then that Fugaku looked up and saw Hiruzen standing by the door to his home. His face displayed a darkness on it that Fugaku hadn't seen since the Nine Tails escaped. He pat the boys on the head. Why don't you go inside and play? I'm going to talk to Lord Hiruzen. The boys then ran off to play some more. Fugaku walked up to Hiruzen. I know that look. Something really bad has happened. What is it? Hiruzen took a deep breath as if trying to decide how he was going to say this. It's about the Hyuga clan. Itachi was in the house with Makoto. She was cleaning up his skinned knees and wrapping them up to stave off infection and help them heal. Itachi winced as the alcohol was applied. Makoto had a soft smile on her face as she focused on the task. Despite her attention to his knees, she still managed to ask how it went. Itachi told her the honest truth, that he was disappointed because he was so close, merely a half a foot away from victory before he was caught by his father. But he did take pride in the fact that it forced his father to make use of his Mangekyo Sharingan to win. Makoto's face did not betray her thoughts on this, as she maintained the same expression and level of attentiveness as before. Deep down, she believed that Fugaku had done that on purpose. Fugaku was a very competitive man, and this included the games he played. Fugaku was not a man to let anyone win, and he would go to any lengths to beat you, even so far as forgetting that he was playing a simple game with a 12-year-old. You forced him to use his Mangekyo. That means he had to use his full power just to stop you, and you still almost won. I wouldn't be disappointed with that. In the next few months, as you continue to grow stronger, you'll overtake him. And that promise is a prize worth more than a moment of victory. 
Itachi smiled. That's what dad said. He said we could beat him in about a month. I suppose I'm just a little let down. I was certain I had beaten him. She gently wrapped the bandages around his knees. I know you are, but keep your eyes on the positives and find a silver lining in every bad thing. If you do this and you always look for the good, she looked up and smiled, putting her hands on his cheek. That's all you'll ever see. Itachi's eyes sparkled as he considered her logic. She hadn't said it and she didn't need to. There would always be bad and this outlook she was recommending didn't stop pain from entering your life, but it could help alleviate it and help keep you happy. Suddenly, Itachi coughed. Not once or twice, but a whole fit. Makoto began to pat his back. Are you okay, Itachi? He nodded. I, I just got a little strangled. My bad. Makoto put her hand to his head. Itachi, you have a fever. Are you sure you're okay? She pushed his hair from his face and for the first time his expression changed. Now it displayed a bit of anxiousness. I'll be fine, mom, he said. It's just that time of year again. You know I get fevers when allergy season rolls around. She seemed to smile a bit. She kissed his head and helped him stand. She pat his back. Go off and play with the others. Itachi nodded and ran off. Makoto turned back to watch him go for a moment and felt as if her heart had stopped for just a moment. She took a breath and ignored whatever feeling this was and went about her daily duties as mother. All the while, Fugaku was in his office with Hiruzen. Fugaku slumped in his chair, his elbow on the armrest, hand raised over his face as he tried to process this new information. The Hyuga clan? I checked it out myself, Hiruzen said as he sat in the most comfortable chair Fugaku could provide. Hiyashi Hyuga was murdered as was his father, the elder, and his daughter, Hinata. The whole clan was found slaughtered, except for one, Hanabi. She was the only one spared. Fugaku didn't know what to say or do about this. What is it that the Uchiha clan can do to help in this situation? Hiruzen thought for a moment. Whatever slack left behind by the Hyuga will have to be evenly distributed among the rest of Konoha's three noble clans. I've already spoken to the Abarame clan about this and need to speak with the Akamichi clan next. Whatever there is that you can do to aid the others will be most welcome. Fugaku stood from his seat and helped up Hiruzen. Of course, I will be glad to. He walked Hiruzen to the door. One final thing. How's the investigation come? Do you have any idea of who may be behind this? Hiruzen stroked his chin. We have no suspect yet. However, we're interviewing Hanabi right now. Fugaku seemed a little concerned. Is she really a reliable witness? She's probably no older than two, correct? Hiruzen took a breath and released it as a sigh. She is the only lead we have. We'll have to make do. We'll attempt to corroborate her statements with any evidence we can find to make sure that what she's saying is correct. In the meantime, I actually came to offer a mission to your children. If you would, have them meet me sometime tomorrow. Then we can discuss their mission objectives. Fugaku nodded. I'll let them know. Hiruzen smiled and bid him good day before leaving to continue making his rounds, notifying the rest of the noble clans. Fugaku returned to the interior of his house and made his way to the room where his children were. There he found Sasuke and Naruto playing a video game, and Itachi in the corner, snuggled up in a blanket, resting on a pile of stuffed animals. He looked like he was sleeping really hard. Fugaku laughed a little. Play hard, rest hard. He turned to Sasuke and Naruto and began to talk to them about it. He told them that Hiruzen was hoping to meet with them sometime in the morning to discuss a mission and to inform Itachi when he woke up. Naruto and Sasuke acknowledged this and returned to their game. The day thereafter, Itachi, Sasuke, and Naruto set out at the brink of dawn for the Hokage's residence. There they waited for Hiruzen to speak. Itachi was the head of their little group and would be the one in charge of the mission as per usual. Sasuke and Naruto never contested this, as Itachi was by far the strongest of the three, as well as the wisest and most intelligent. Itachi was one of those who came once in a lifetime that you knew had no fate other than becoming Hokage. That was the honest truth of it. Following Itachi's example, they stood with honor and pride, not speaking and maintaining their patience so as to let Hiruzen prepare in peace. This politeness was something that always caught Hiruzen's eye. If only all generations of Shinobi could be like this one. He smiled and pushed a piece of paper toward their side of the desk. Itachi reached out and took the slip. Hiruzen began to explain that there was a certain bridge worker who needed an escort to the Land of Waves, and that Itachi's team was chosen to perform the mission due to their display of skill in prior missions. Itachi and his team were excited about this and their ability to help Konoha once again. The trio would then return to their home for an hour to pack properly and inform their family of the mission and the time frame that they were expected to be gone from the village. 
Fugaku, proud of his three sons, would bid them all farewell while Makoto helped them pack. Makoto eventually made her way to Itachi, who by this time had already managed to finish packing. She smiled and pulled him into her embrace. Are you sure you feel okay to go on this mission, Itachi? If you're still feeling sick, we can tell Mr. Hiruzen and he'll understand. Itachi smiled. I feel fine, Mom. You worry too much. A little time out of the village will do me good. Makoto would kiss his cheek, embarrassing the boy a little. Okay, but don't push yourself too hard and be sure to stay safe and have fun. She then saw the trio off. Itachi, Sasuke, and Naruto would eventually find Tezuna who was waiting for them by the gate. The old man seemed tired and ready to go home. He looked like he'd been standing there for hours and his expression was that of someone who was beginning to lose patience. His expression shifted to confusion when he saw three children approach him. Wait, they're sending me out with kids? I thought I paid for Joni, not juniors. Itachi offered him a smile. With all due respect, sir, we're considered elite shinobi by comparison with the rest in our age range. We'll do in a pinch. Tazuna sighed. You better be exactly what I paid for. And so the group of four set out, as they did what you would normally expect occurred. The demon brothers pop out to ambush them, but they're completely fodderized by Itachi, Sasuke, and Naruto, all of which have been training their rears off for as long as they could walk and do hand signs. And with the skills these three possess, it becomes very clear to Dezuna why he was sent these kids. In fact, he begins to wonder if he didn't quite pay enough for this. They're that good in his eyes. But just because the Demon Brothers were practically nothing to them, it doesn't mean the same will be true of Zabuza. Now, Zabuza is one of the seven ninja swordsmen of the mist, and you don't just become one of those because you like to talk about swords. No, he is one of the better shinobi that all of Kiri has to offer, or technically, had had to offer. I say this because he's not really with Kitty anymore. He's rogue and working as a mercenary, and right now he was hired to have Tezuna killed, and the only thing standing in his way are these three children, so a battle takes place. However, he comes to realize really late that he's dealing with some of the better shinobi this generation has to offer. Itachi himself has the capabilities and know-how to really give Zabuza a run for his money, particularly because the boy already has a set of three Tomoe Sharingan. Sasuke has an eye with two and an eye with one, but regardless of that, he's still a threat. Sasuke would team up with Itachi to push forward when he sees Itachi starting to struggle. By this time, the battle is a dead even match, but here comes Naruto to tip the balances. If Sasuke and Itachi were spearheads, Naruto is a hammer. He may not be as accurate or graceful, but he has the strength and force behind him to shatter defenses like it doesn't even matter, particularly because his training at this time under Fugaku, sanctioned by Hiruzen, has led to him making use of the version 1 cloak and mastering it. Version 2 is still way out of reach, but that's okay as it leaves him room to grow. Together, the three manage to just outwit Zabuza, causing him to flee. Tazuna watches Zabuza get away and clicks his tongue. That's gonna be an issue in the future. He looks to the three of them and crosses his arms with a smile. I must say, the level of skill you kids have is utterly incredible. I never would have guessed that such a large amount of skill could be hidden within such a small package. Suddenly, Itachi's knees buckle and he hits the ground to the surprise of everyone else. He grips at his chest and wheezes loudly. He coughs and falls to his side. Sasuke runs to him. Itachi! He holds him up. Itachi! Itachi, what's wrong? Itachi tries to form words, but he can't speak. He almost sounds like he's choking on the oxygen he's attempting to breathe, and Sasuke believes that he witnesses blood on Itachi's teeth. Tazuna comes to their side and looks to Itachi. What happened to him? This doesn't seem right. Naruto is just standing a little ways away, still in shock, trying to process what just happened. He'd never seen this before. Tazuna picks Itachi up. We're not far from my house. We're gonna get him there and let him rest. The group then rush to Tazuna's home where he allows Itachi to rest. Tazuna calls for a doctor. Now, given how Gato had taken control of their little village, poverty had risen. The people could just hardly afford doctors, and doctors didn't have the proper time to study as they had to scramble for some other way to make money to keep themselves and their families afloat. So, the best you had were usually people of the same level of knowledge as a low-level nurse. The doctor would come and check up on Itachi to see what was wrong. They wait outside nervously. Tazuna, at this point, despite knowing their skill, is reminded that they're just kids, not too different from Inari. They're skilled, and so they should be. When something happens to your friend, like what they just witnessed, fear is the only reaction. But he also gives them encouragement, telling them that it'll all be okay, and reminding them that they performed properly during the emergency, telling them that it was a testament to how truly ingrained into their being their skill was. 
Eventually, the doctor would come out and Sasuke is the first to act about it. The doctor wipes his hands. Does your brother have a history with asthma? Chronic bronchitis? Tuberculosis? Sasuke shakes his head. The doctor takes a deep breath and releases it slowly. Well, I've prescribed some antibiotics. It seems that the restricted breathing fit has passed, but I suggest plenty of bed rest and nothing too strenuous until he can get a proper diagnosis and treatment by someone with better medical knowledge than I. Sasuke nodded, as did Naruto. After the doctor left, the two of them would enter Itachi's room to see him laying there in the bed, resting. His face gave off the impression that he was miserable, and such an expression was only natural for someone who went through what he had gone through. The two boys sat there by his side the entire time, with Tezuna watching. He spoke to them quietly. Be careful, boys. If he has tuberculosis, it could be contagious. Sasuke didn't even look back. I don't care. He's my brother, and I'm not going to leave him to suffer alone. The day after, Sasuke and Naruto were on the bridge with the builders having left Itachi behind to rest. Through the night, Itachi had developed a fever that still hadn't gone away, and Sasuke had been up practically all night tending to him. Now, currently, Tsunami had taken it upon herself to tend to Itachi's needs, but Sasuke and Naruto had not slept much, and though they were trained to go quite some time without sleep, the fatigue was catching up with them. That's when both Haku and Zabuza showed up. Naruto and Sasuke would split their adversaries between each other, with Naruto taking Haku and Sasuke taking Zabuza. The four did battle for a while, and though Naruto and Sasuke were strong, neither could gain purchase over the other, and it became a long battle of attrition. That was until Gato showed up with his mob. Sasuke and Naruto looked over, and to their horror, they saw that Gato's men had captured the inhabitants of Tezuna's household, including Itachi. Sasuke raised his hand. Wait, 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 wait. Gato raised a brow and smiled. Oh, is this shinobi here worth something to you? Sasuke on his knees sat there. Please, I beg of you, spare him. Gato's smile shifted into a grin. And what are you willing to do for this? Sasuke's eyes were turned down toward the concrete. Anything. He's my brother. Gato began to laugh. All right, kill the old man. Sasuke looked up. What? You heard me, Gato said as his grip around Itachi's neck tightened. Kill Tazuna and I'll let your brother go. Sasuke stood and took out a kunai and walked to Tazuna. He looked at it in his hand. Take an innocent life and abandon your mission. All to save your brother. Could he really do it? Should he? Sasuke shook his head as he began to tear up. He fell to his knees. I, I can't do it. Tazuna saw this. There was no sense in sending children out to do a man's job. That was the issue with Konoha sending these kids, or any kids for that matter, out on missions alone. All the same, Tazuna couldn't stand watching Sasuke being forced to choose. And so, Tazuna took the kunai from him and ended his own life. Sasuke asked him why he would do such a thing, and with Tazuna's final breath, he spoke. I did it so that Inari and Tsunami are safe. Tazuna then fell over. Sasuke stood. Slowly, the men Gato had brought with him crossed the bridge and began slaughtering the workers, all while Sasuke couldn't take his eyes off Tazuna's body. He only looked away when he turned to Gato. The old Yakuza adjusted his glasses and smiled. A deal's a deal. The Shinobi is yours. If you can save him. He then threw Itachi off of the bridge into the water below. Sasuke ran to the edge. Itachi! He saw him hit the water. Sasuke would dive down into it below and swim deeper until he found Itachi and began pulling him back to the surface. Sasuke coughed as his lungs tried to expel the water they had inadvertently taken in. Naruto stood on the bridge's edge and looked down. Sasuke looked up. N Naruto, help me! Naruto dived in as well and helped pull Sasuke and Itachi up from the water. The trio then rested for a bit in Tazuna's home. Tsunami and Inari had been spared due to the actions of Tazuna, but Tsunami was now quiet. She didn't speak to the boys, and Inari was so full of rage that he cursed them and spat at them. On one occasion, he even tried to attack Sasuke, screaming that heroes don't exist, and that he should have known that Sasuke would be so selfish. The guilt began to eat away at Sasuke as he realized he'd been too weak to stop Tazuna. But what else was he supposed to do? He was about to lose Itachi. For about a day, they rested. Then, when Itachi was well enough to travel, they began to make their way back to Konoha, where Sasuke would give an account for the mission to which Hiruzen would say was unfortunate and mark it as a failure. He would then begin organizing a mission to send more shinobi to the Land of Waves in an attempt to break Gato's control, which would likely lead to a bloody conflict. One Konoha would eventually win, but not without cost. 
Returning to their family's household, Itachi would be brought in by Sasuke, and Fugaku and Makoto would both rush to their side, worried for Itachi's sake. Makoto would tell Itachi that she thought it was too early for him to go, to which Fugaku would ask her what this meant. She would tell Fugaku everything about his cough and low-grade fever he had the day of their training session. She had thought it was allergies, but according to what Sasuke and Naruto had said, as well as the doctor who had come by to check him out, it was far worse than that. Makoto would tend to Itachi and stay by his side, helping him fight his fever. Fugaku would send for another doctor to get a second opinion, as even the doctor of the Land of Waves recommended. The doctor would arrive and enter Itachi's room to begin the examination, questioning Itachi on symptoms and giving him a complete physical, including a blood test. Makoto would be pacing the floor in Fugaku's office as he sat in his chair. Naruto and Sasuke were instructed to just go to another room and play video games or something, which they were doing, though they remained very quiet, as if only going through the motions. Fugaku watched his wife. Wouldn't you like to sit down, Makoto? He asked. She shook her head. No, I don't think I can. Not with Itachi like this. Fugaku stood and walked over to her and put his hands on her shoulders. It's going to be okay. These things happen sometimes, and they always get better. Remember what you told me all those years ago. Look for the silver lining and focus on that. She shook her head. I can't. There isn't one. Fugaku felt his heart drop. Why do you say that? She blinked. I don't know. I just feel that way. It wasn't much longer before the doctor came into the office. He knocked once on the door jam before Fugaku invited him in. Fugaku sat down in a chair, as did Makoto. The doctor also took a seat. How is he, doctor? Fugaku asked. Makoto stared on with intensity in her eyes, as if somehow what this man said next would dictate whether she lived or died. The doctor sat there for a moment, silently, looking as if he wanted to speak, but every time he took a breath, he let it back out with a sigh and tried again. I've been doing some tests, and he trailed off. And what? Just spit it out, damn it! Fugaku exclaimed as he leaned back in his chair. The doctor, a little startled by this outburst, tried to collect himself before beginning again. I ran a complete physical and noted some unusual things in your son's physical health. First off, he's quite underweight. Have you noticed? Fugaku shook his head. I haven't. The doctor continued. He's been steadily losing weight for a while and I believe he may have been trying to hide it. I can see each of his ribs clearly, as well as his spine. Makoto seemed shocked. We feed him well enough. The doctor nods. I'm sure you do. I'm not saying you don't, Miss Makoto. This is an abnormality within his body. He said that this has been going on for a while and he didn't want to alarm anyone. He assumed he just wasn't eating enough. And considering the nature of his symptoms, I believe we're going to have to run more extensive tests. I've taken a sample of his blood and I'm going to look into it to see what's wrong. For now, I encourage you to make sure he's resting and let me know if there's any change in his physical condition. Fugaku and Makoto nodded and let him leave. After he was gone, Fugaku walked into Itachi's room where the boy was resting. He knelt down beside him. Itachi. Itachi opened his eyes. Yeah? Fugaku swallowed. Why didn't you tell us this stuff was going on? Itachi was silent for a moment, as if he were trying to properly articulate what he was going to say next. I didn't want you to worry about me. I didn't think it was a big deal. Fugaku shook his head. The doctor said you're sickly thin. You should have known that something wasn't right, and you should have told us. Why did you go so long without mentioning this? Itachi looked at his father with a hint of a tear in his eye. I'm sorry, Papa. Fugaku immediately melted. I love you, you know this, right? I love you more than anything in the whole world and I would die for you. I just want you to be healthy. Fugaku stood. Get some rest. As he was about to step out, he heard a voice speak. I lied. Fugaku looked back to see Itachi was sitting up in bed. I lied, father. Fugaku turned around. About what? Itachi looked up, tears starting to drip down his cheeks. I knew something was wrong with me, and I didn't tell you because I was afraid that... Afraid of what? Fugaku asked. Itachi almost lost composure, as the sound of his voice proved. I was afraid you would stop letting me go on missions. Stop letting me train with you. His voice was breaking down more and more as his face was displaying anguish. Stop letting me serve Konoha. He finally broke all the way down. And stop letting me play with Sasuke and Naruto. Tears fell down his cheeks as he cried. Fugaku sat down on the bed beside Itachi and held him in his arms. You're right. I would've. And you know why that is? It's because I love you and making sure you're healthy means more to me than what kind of shinobi you'll grow up to be. He sat Itachi on his lap. You know I would've been so happy no matter what dream you had chosen. 
If you had chosen to do anything else other than be a shinobi, I would have been proud, and I still would be even if you or your brothers decide to change careers at any time. I'm upset because you let yourself continue and get more and more unhealthy without telling me. That's why I'm so upset. And yes, I am going to take you off of missions and training, but I'm not going to tell you that you can't play with your brothers. I just want you to get better, okay? Itachi nodded, but hadn't yet stopped crying. Fugaku would hold his son as he rocked him back and forth. Out of the corner of his eye, Fugaku noticed Sasuke watching from around the corner. Their eyes met and locked on for the span of about five seconds before Sasuke turned and walked on. Fugaku stayed with Itachi and kept him company until eventually he fell asleep. Some time would pass and Fugaku would explain to Makoto what he had said and it would startle her. To know how far he'd been pushing himself, neglecting his own health just to please his father. That upset her more than words could dictate and Fugaku shared the same sentiment. Eventually, the test results would come back and the doctor would return to speak with them about it. Fugaku and Makoto would be sitting there in their chairs. The doctor would also take a seat and begin to speak. I'm sorry to tell you this, but the results of the blood test showed that he has an abnormally high level of CEA in his blood. Fugaku tried to understand. What does this mean exactly? The doctor continued. It's a protein that's normally found during pregnancy and is present in a baby as it grows. Normally, this protein begins to drop off after birth. Such incredible amounts of it after birth, particularly when one is in or close to adulthood, is generally a sign of a tumor. Makoto's eyes got wider and wider as her brow began to furrow more and more. Tumor? The doctor nodded. We believe that Itachi may have lung cancer. Fugaku groaned as he sat forward. How long has he had it? Can he be cured? The doctor took a breath. We don't know. It's hard to say without more tests. You will need to bring him in to see for certain where he is, and from there we can brainstorm treatments. But for now, it's paramount that you don't let him overexert himself. Makoto and Fugaku were silent. The doctor stood. I'll set up an appointment. I'll see you later. He left. Makoto just sat there, silently. Cancer. Itachi has... As the doctor left the room, he noticed Sasuke standing outside of the room, looking up at him with a tearful look in his eyes. Sasuke made his way up the stairs into his room where he shut the door and locked it. He began to cry. He fell to his knees. How could this happen? Why? Why does Itachi have to be sick? He asked himself, wondering where the silver lining to this was. How unfair. How cruel and unfair a fate this was. As he sat there and cried, slowly, Sasuke's tears turned to blood. The appearance of a dark flower appearing in the iris of his eye. Itachi... Fugaku and Makoto sat in the office with the doctor. Itachi was resting on his mother's lap. His head rested against her chest as he seemed to have been wiped out by the tests he took. The room was filled with an air of dread. The humidity of it bolstered by the small size and the increased perspiration of his parents. Itachi felt comfort in this warmth and in it he found himself straddling the line between alertness and the realm of dreams. Stage 4, the doctor said. Fugaku felt as if he were going to have a heart attack. Stage four? What the hell are we gonna do about it? What are the treatments? How do we fight this? The doctor clasped his fingers and pressed his brow into them. We can't do anything. It's too far along. The best we could possibly do is slow it down. Fugaku stood and slammed his hands against the table. We can't stand here and do nothing. The doctor looked up. We don't have treatments that can undo this, Fugaku. We can fight it as hard as we want, but we won't win. This is terminal. In the end, we need to think about quality of life. Do you want your son to be in immense pain even though you know he won't pull out of it? Do you want to ruin what little time he has left with you? Fugaku stood there, tears dripping from his eyes as his fist slammed against the table. I don't want to say there was a chance and I didn't try. The doctor leaned forward. Fugaku, do you trust me? Fugaku looked at him. The doctor spoke. I took an oath to always do what is in the best interest of my patients. What I'm doing now is in hopes of leading to the best outcome. Do you trust me? Fugaku fell to his knees. Please, there has to be something we can do. The doctor stood and placed his hand on Fugaku's shoulder. There is. Take him home and keep him happy. Surround him with love and let him go in peace. Fugaku and Makoto went home with Itachi. He was sleeping by this time in their arms. Fugaku and Makoto had wished that they too were sleeping, because then they could wake up from this nightmare. They sat down in their abode on the couch, just holding on to Itachi as he slept. As Fugaku felt his son resting against his chest, he couldn't help but look back. The day Itachi was born, he had done the same. Oh, how he had grown. 
but he hadn't finished yet. He hadn't finished growing, and already twilight was on the horizon. Why? Why did it have to be this way? Why did Fugaku have to watch this? As he held his son tightly in his arms, his eyes once more overflowing with tears, he wondered why it couldn't have happened to him instead. I am older, he said to himself. I'm an adult. I have fought in the Third Shinobi World War. I've killed people. Why can't this happen to me instead? I'm the one who deserves it, not Itachi. Makoto sat there, tears in her own eyes as she reached out and tried to wipe Fugaku's away. Makoto, what are we going to do? He's dying and we can't stop it. What do we do? Makoto shook her head. I don't know. She had never seen Fugaku like this before. She understood why though. Fugaku was a man who liked to tip everything in his favor. He liked for everything to be under control, particularly under his control. But this was not and it stung. Not just because he couldn't control it, but because he knew what the outcome was for this thing that he couldn't control. She leaned forward and wrapped her arms around both Fugaku and Itachi, sandwiching the boy in the familial love of his parents. It was just then that Sasuke and Naruto were coming down the stairs. They saw the scene. No words had to be said. Sasuke and Naruto already felt the heaviness, saw the tears, and knew the truth. They made their way down the stairs and to their family. They too hugged on. And as they did, Fugaku managed to somewhat gain control of himself with a deep breath. He looked to his children. Listen, he said in a calming tone, your brother is asleep right now. When he wakes up, we do not speak of any of this around him. We need to be strong, specifically for him, okay? So we don't cry around him, we don't talk about this around him, and we let him have his way on pretty much anything he wants. Each of the boys agreed to this. As time passed, things began to grow a bit more normal. The thought of this situation was ever present in everyone's lives, but they hid it well, going about their daily lives, training and playing about. Though Itachi didn't train, he would spend time playing with Naruto and Sasuke. And when training happened, Itachi would spend time with his mother, what he called the silver lining. This was one of the most heartbreaking aspects, because Itachi wanted to train with Naruto and Sasuke, but he couldn't anymore, which led to Itachi feeling a bit left out. Makoto attempted to help her son through these feelings by spending more time with him. He would smile, of course, but she could see it in his eyes. On one occasion, Fugaku was going about his daily duties in Konoha when he was called to the office by Hiruzen. Taking a seat, the two would begin speaking. Hiruzen was getting down to business. The Chunin exams are coming very soon. The village will need the police force active to keep the peace. There's no telling who might use this as an opportunity to bring shame and harm upon the village. So we need you and the rest of your clan to remain ever vigilant, to help ensure that things run smoothly. The quality of your work is what will determine whether these exams become a bridge to world peace or a bridge to world war. Fugaku gave a slight bow. Yes, Lord Third. A moment passed as Hiruzen sat there, his face turning to a light, though slightly dim smile. How is your son? Hiruzen asked. Fugaku did not raise his head from the bow. He's... he's very brave. Hiruzen nodded solemnly. If it's any consolation, I've called in my pupil Tsunade. She should be in the village soon. She is the most skilled medical nin I have ever seen, and her work on people can do what many would consider a miracle. If anyone can help Itachi, it will be her. Fugaku looked up at Hiruzen, obviously fighting back tears. Thank you, Lord Hiruzen. Hiruzen sat forward. In the meantime, I wish to keep your family busy. They say that idle hands do the devil's work, and so I'm hoping to keep all of you active in the community, if for no other reason than to take your minds off of things. I would like to offer Naruto and Sasuke the chance to enter the exams. As it stands, the exams will require a team of three, but I'll make an exception for Naruto and Sasuke. I'll even give you, Makoto, and Itachi front row seats to the exhibition matches alongside me in the Hokage's viewing box. What do you say? Fugaku once more lowered his head. My lord, this is so much. How can I ever repay you for your kindness? Hiruzen stood and sat Fugaku up. Kindness should not need to be repaid. If love came with conditions, would it even be love? If you want me to attach conditions to this, then my only condition is to ensure that Itachi has the time of his life. And when Tsunade comes, make use of her medical prowess to try and heal your child. Fugaku's eyes ran over with tears. Thank you so much. Hiruzen, coming down to his knees, which seemed to creak as he knelt down, offered Fugaku a hug. Itachi was at home with his mother. They were both in the kitchen. 
Lunch had already passed and Naruto and Sasuke were back outside training. Itachi, unable to join them, decided to help his mother with some chores. He stood there, helping her wash the dishes. She would wash them and then dip them in water to rinse them off before giving them to Itachi who would dry them and put them away. This cycle seemed to go on forever and for that time, Makoto was fine with it. If she could have this moment last for a million years, she would wash the dishes until her muscles fell from her bones in her hand. Anything to spend even a moment more with her child. However, as Itachi took a knife from his mother, he slipped and accidentally cut himself. He let out a quick gasp. She turned around and saw him holding his hand. She knelt down and grabbed the towel. Let me see. Let me see. She looked at the cut. It was rather deep and blood seemed to pour from the wound. She covered it up. Are you okay? Itachi nodded. I will be. Makoto smiled. Come, let's get it cleaned up. She took him into the living room where she sat him down and grabbed a first aid kit. She opened the box and began taking things out of it. Once upon a time, she had done this for his skinned knee. That was the day she knew everything would change, and now she prayed that day might repeat and that today everything would change for the better. Let me see your hand. Itachi unwrapped it. Makoto went to clean it, but to her surprise, she saw that the wound was already partially closed, a touch of steam appearing to exit it. What is this? Itachi looked at it. It must be the power of the Ninetales. Makoto looked up, confused. As Itachi explained it to her, he thought back to the moment. He'd been playing with Naruto and Sasuke when his body seemed to grow weak suddenly. He grew dizzy and fell, cutting his knee pretty badly. Naruto and Sasuke would rush back to him to see what happened. Upon seeing the blood of his knee, they would try to comfort him. That was when Naruto came up with the idea of sharing some of the power of the Ninetales. How was it that Naruto knew how to do this? That was unknown. One might chalk it up to the remnants of Minato's chakra within Naruto offering him this blessing, showing him how to cleave the chakra of the tailed beast. The Nine Tails was carved into three, Naruto offering the Yin Third to Sasuke and what was called the Wuji Third to Itachi. Of course, it also seemed that Naruto didn't really understand the concept of the Tao, as Wuji was the state of being before Yin and Yang, when both were one. It wasn't the third part, but nonetheless, Itachi accepted it with joy. And because of this, Itachi had felt his strength increasing, as well as his healing factor. And that was what led to this here today, to Itachi's hand healing more quickly than Makoto could treat it. She understood. Naruto was very kind to share it with you, she said. Something so valuable to him, you should find a way to thank him. It was about that time that Fugaku returned home. Casting off the bag around his shoulder, he stepped in. I have some good news. Makoto looked back. Good news. He nodded. I want the entire family here for the announcement. Makoto nodded and went to the back door. Naruto, Sasuke, your father's home. He wants to talk to you. She saw Naruto and Sasuke push away from their clash to look over. Sasuke raised his hand to verify that they had heard her. She returned to the house and waited in the living room with Itachi as Fugaku stood there with a smile on his face. She had not seen him smile like this in a long while. Something truly wonderful must be occurring. Naruto and Sasuke would eventually return to the house and take their seat at Fugaku's request. Fugaku then spoke. I have a few pieces of news that I wanted to share with you. First, Naruto, Sasuke, Lord Third has given his approval for you two to enter the Chunin exams. Naruto and Sasuke almost immediately leapt out of their seats. Really? We're going to get to take the exams? Fugaku nodded with a smile. Indeed. You two should train very hard. He looked over at Itachi, who covered his disappointment that he would be unable to join them with a small smile of happiness that they were getting the chance to ascend to a new rank. Fugaku walked over and knelt down and took Itachi's hand in his own. I have more good news, Itachi. Hiruzen said he's calling Tsunade back to the village. She's perhaps the world's best medical nin, and her feats of healing are nothing short of legendary. She's coming to the village specifically to treat you. Itachi's eyes lit up. Does that mean I might get better? Fugaku smiled. I have hope. Itachi smiled and hugged his father. He pat his son's head. Itachi was so happy, tears were streaming down his cheek. If I get better, maybe I can take the tuning exams next time. Fugaku laughed. Of course. If you get better, I'll take time to personally train you and get you even to Jonin levels of strength before the next tuning exams. Makoto came in from behind to hug Itachi with Naruto and Sasuke both joining thereafter. Fugaku then spoke. Lord Fourth also offered to give us a perfect view of the exams when they happen. 
so even if you can't participate this time, Itachi, you'll get to watch and enjoy the exhibitions. I would love that, Itachi said with a voice full of joy. I love that, and I love you, Dad. And so, as the dates grew nearer, Naruto and Sasuke doubled down on their training. With Fugaku doing his best to coordinate the police force to better protect the village as others from the outside began to come in. Among those showing up in the village was Tsunade. It had been quite some time since she had been in Konoha. She noted that, though it was full of many memories she'd like to forget, it was nice to be back in her home village. But she didn't have much time to rest. She would end up going to the apartment that was provided to her where she would clean up quickly and get her things unpacked. She would then make her way out and head for the home of Fugaku Uchiha. She would enter the home to find Itachi and Makoto happily waiting for her. To be honest, for a boy as sick as she was told, he seemed to have plenty of energy and was beaming with excitement at her arrival, which was a welcome feeling. You must be Makoto, and this is Itachi, I assume. Makoto smiled. Yes, you must be Tsunade. I've heard only great things about you. Tsunade scoffed her way into a laugh. Then whoever told you about me didn't tell you the full story. She began going through her bag. Let's get down to brass tacks. She walked over to Itachi. We'll begin the examination, yes? Tsunade began to examine Itachi and take the medical reports that had been made throughout his life, as well as the more recent one that showed the illness. At this point, Tsunade knew more about Itachi's medical history and current condition than any single person did, and that was exactly what was going to make or break this whole situation. Tsunade would stand. She would crack her neck a little and let out a relieving sigh, as though she had just done something extremely strenuous, and, you know, perhaps she had. She looked to Makoto and Itachi. The illness has truly come a long way without anyone knowing about it. Can it be stopped? Makoto asked with a hint of hesitation. Tsunade thought about it for a moment. Honestly, it's gonna be a challenge, but she looked to their faces full of anticipation. She let off a smile. I think I might be able to do something. Itachi and Makoto's faces both lit up. Tsunade held out her hand to slow them down. Now hold on, don't get overly excited. This is gonna be a long, grueling fight. It's not going to be easy on anyone here, least of all Itachi. And even then, there's a chance it might fail. But there's hope, Makoto asked. Tsunade nodded. Yes, there is hope. That's all I need, Itachi said. A little hope and all the tools necessary to succeed. Leave the willpower to me. Tsunade nodded with a bit of pride. This boy was truly special. She pulled out a bottle from her bag and handed it to Makoto. See that he takes these twice a day. One at breakfast and one before dinner. Just make sure he takes it with food. This will help slow down the progression while I work on a tailor-made treatment just for him. Makoto took the bottle in her hands and looked at the label. She smiled at Tsunade. Thank you. Tsunade closed up her bag and made her way to the door. It's paramount that he gets plenty of rest. Don't let him overwork himself and make sure he sleeps at least a full eight hours a night. I'll get back to you soon with his treatments. She left. Makoto hugged Itachi tight and kissed his cheek. We're going to fight harder than the third Shinobi World War on this, Itachi. And once this is behind us, you'll go on to become Hokage just as you dreamed. The rest of the day seemed to fly by. Everyone returned home from training and preparing for the test. They would have a family meal together. Mokoto would give Itachi a pill and they'd sit down to eat. They would discuss what Tsunade had told them. Fugaku knew that the path forward was going to be painful, but there was light at the end of that tunnel. And so long as Itachi came out of this happy and healthy, there was no pain that Fugaku wouldn't bear. After dinner, they would spend time playing games and doing things as a family that they found fun until about 11pm. It was then that they would all decide to turn in for the night. Laying him down in his bed, Makoto and Fugaku would kneel next to him and tell him how much they loved him. Sleep well, little warrior, Fugaku said as his lips pressed to Itachi's forehead. Makoto was next. She kissed his cheek. Sleep well. You'll need all the strength you can get to kick this thing's butt. Itachi would smile and acknowledge their words, telling them good night. They would then turn out the lights and close the door. They would then move on to Naruto and Sasuke's room. Makoto knelt down by Naruto's bed and stroked his hair. That was really nice of you, giving Itachi and Sasuke a part of the Nine Tails. I'm so proud of you. Your heart is so large that few can compare. Naruto shook his head. Itachi's my brother. I would do anything to help him. Makoto almost came to tears. She kissed Naruto's forehead slowly and gently. What did I ever do to deserve being blessed with such kind and loving children? On the other side of the room, Fugaku was kneeling next to Sasuke. You excited about the Chunin exams? The boy solemnly nodded. What's wrong? Sasuke looked up. I wish Itachi could take the test with us. 
Fugaku smiled. Your brother is fighting a different fight, and it's just as important as yours. Sasuke sat there silently. I don't know if I want to take the Chunin exams. Why not? Fugaku asked as he pushed Sasuke's hair to the side. I want me, Naruto, and Itachi to take this test as a team. I don't want to... I, I don't want to leave Itachi behind. Fugaku took a deep breath and let it out with a smile. Itachi's looking forward to watching you. Did you know that? He wants to cheer you on. You aren't leaving him behind. You're showing him your strength. And he'll use that strength to fight on his own and defeat this. Then he'll catch up to you all over again. So don't take this test for yourself. Take it for Itachi, okay? Sasuke nodded. I'll do my best. Attaboy. Fugaku would kiss Sasuke's head. After this, he would turn out the lights and close the door behind him as he and Makoto left. The day after, they woke up, had breakfast, and went on to do their daily duties. Fugaku had to return to Police HQ to run the final checks on the test as Sasuke and Naruto made their way to the location of the exam's start. Makoto and Itachi went about their day, going out into the village to experience everything. Itachi was sure to wear his headband, bearing the mark of his village as he went, hoping to be a good representative. There were people here from everywhere. Shinobi from Kusagakure, Amegakure, Sunagakure. It was the most alive Itachi had ever seen the village, and it made him happy. But what he didn't see were the forces of darkness moving around behind. Neji Hyuga and his father Hizashi were both in the village. And you're certain that this Naruto Uzumaki and Sasuke Uchiha are the next incarnations of Indra and Ashura? Neji asked. Hizashi nodded, his face still hidden behind a mask. Indeed it is. As an impure reincarnation myself, I can sense the history of the chakra that flows through them. Neji nodded. Fine, then let's grab them. Hizashi held out his hand to stop his son. Neji looked up at his father with curiosity. If we take them now, Hizashi said, then the entire village will know and will be hunted and destroyed. We must wait for the opportune moment, a time during the exams, then we can take them. Neji sighed and reluctantly agreed to this, and so the two continued to simply watch. Naruto and Sasuke were brought into the exams where they were surrounded by people older than them and of a higher number. Perhaps we won't have to worry about waiting on Itachi, Sasuke said. Yeah, these guys might knock us out in the first round. Sasuke honestly wasn't so sure. The trauma of Itachi's diagnosis had awakened within him the Mongekyo Sharingan. With a little bit of training, Sasuke had discovered many new techniques, among which was the ability to generate black flames, and the second was to alter that fire. Besides that, he found that he could create and manipulate part of a chakra avatar. It was still incomplete, but he could. Eventually, they'd be led to a new room to take a written test. The test was simple for Sasuke, but for Naruto, it required pure luck. The questions were insanely difficult, but the more Sasuke looked at them, the more he believed that Itachi would have no issue at all. They managed to pass through, and so they were taken into the Forest of Death. Here, it was a game of Capture the Flag that would last three days. As soon as Naruto and Sasuke went in, they couldn't have known what would happen next. The first day passed, then the second. Finally, the third day passed, and Naruto and Sasuke had yet to finish. Fugaku began to grow weary. As the test ended, he sent a squad of Konoha police officers into the forest to search for Naruto and Sasuke. After sweeping the whole area, they found nothing. This caused Hiruzen to panic. They had just lost their Jinchuriki. What were they going to do? On the fourth night after Naruto and Sasuke entered the Forest of Death, they still found nothing. It was believed that they had been captured and whisked away by another village. Itachi offered to help his father search for Naruto and Sasuke, reminding him that he possessed the Nine Tails, just as Naruto and Sasuke did, and that he could use it to help them find the two. However, Fugaku refused this, telling Itachi that he couldn't. He was too sick to do anything. He needed to stay home, elsewise he could overexert himself and become more ill. Itachi was adamant, however, that Naruto and Sasuke would not be found quickly enough to save their lives unless he intervened. But Fugaku was insistent on Itachi staying home, telling his son that his word was final. Itachi didn't take this well. He believed that his father, in an effort to protect him, would condemn Sasuke and Naruto to death. And so, as night fell upon the household and it was time for Itachi to sleep, he waited until his door was closed. He then got up, grabbed his shinobi gear, and made it outside of the home. He looked back at the home for a moment, silently apologizing within himself before turning and making his way toward the Forest of Death. There, he attempted to sense the presence of the other pieces of the Nine Tails. He picked up on a trail, but strangely, it was leading him away from the forest. He began following it, going through the village into the sewers. 
There, he sensed the chakra of the Ninetales at its strongest. He began to follow the trail through the murky, disgusting wastewater until it led him to another manhole cover. Coming through it, he found himself outside of the village. He followed after the energy, walking well into the morning. Back at his house, his parents would go to wake him up for breakfast. He had an appointment with Tsunade that day that they needed him to be ready for. But as they entered his room, they found it empty. They immediately knew what this meant. Fugaku ordered part of the police force to fan out and search for Itachi as well. Itachi continued walking well into the daylight hours, stopping only for a moment to eat something before continuing his journey. He found himself at the mouth of a cave. Naruto and Sasuke were inside. He was sure of it. He activated his Sharingan and entered the cave. There, he found a deep pool of water. He sensed the Ninetales' residual energy emanating from within that pool of water. He would dive down into it, but as he did, he found bubbles. Each bubble bore with it a reflection of a memory. Itachi would eventually collide with one. Suddenly, it was as if he were transported home. Huh? This isn't right. Wasn't I just... Wait, where was I? Was I... He saw a crowd cheering his name alongside Sasuke and Naruto. I was in the forest of death. I'm in the tuning exams. He smiled. He was enjoying this. It was as if everything in the past had simply fallen away. His illness, his weakness, everything. It was like one bad dream. He was being given a medal by Lord Hirazin for his good work at becoming a Chunin. Sasuke and Naruto placed their arms around his shoulders. If any of us deserve to be a Chunin, it was you, Sasuke said. We are glad to have helped you, Naruto said with a wide grin. Itachi smiled. I couldn't have done it without you. Suddenly, he felt pain in his chest. He fell to his knees. He couldn't help but cough, and as he did, blood poured from his mouth. Huh? Are you alright, Itachi? Sasuke asked. Yeah, are you alright? Naruto asked. Itachi sat there for a moment. Cancer, he said under his breath. He looked up and around. I remember now. This isn't what happened. This was what I wanted to happen. He looked at Naruto and Sasuke and remembered that this was a fantasy he had when he was told that the Chunin exams were going to be held in the village, and that Sasuke and Naruto could join. He looked at his brothers with tears in his eyes. I'm going to save you. I promise, he said. Naruto and Sasuke looked at each other confusedly. Itachi would hug them tightly. As he did so, he would then hold two fingers up. Release. Suddenly, Itachi woke up on the shore of the pool of water. He spewed water from his mouth as he rolled over onto his hands and knees. He sat there for a moment before another coughing fit overtook him. He expelled blood from his mouth. He tried to catch it with his hand. Looking down at the red liquid covering the palm of his hand, he knew he had to hurry. He stood and followed the trail out of the cave. He found himself in an unfamiliar location. An abandoned village, it looked like. This was not like any village he had ever seen on Earth. He continued on, following the trail until it led him to a castle. He saw it and entered. There were no guards, nothing stopping him. He kept to the shadows and continued to follow the trail of the Ninetales. It led him to a particular room where Naruto and Sasuke had been chained up. Itachi walked in. Psst, psst, Naruto, Sasuke, he whispered. Naruto looked up. Itachi? Itachi began to free Naruto from his bonds. What are you doing here? Naruto asked. You're sick. Itachi looked at him. I had to do something. Dad wasn't going to find you. I knew that only I could do that. He then walked over to Sasuke to free him, only to stop when he noticed that Sasuke's eyes had been covered. What's with that? Naruto looked away. They blinded him. Itachi looked over in surprise. What? Naruto refused to look up, unable to look at the torment of his brother. Sasuke developed the Mangekyo Sharingan at some point, and when they captured us, he began sending black fire everywhere, hoping to kill them. He managed to set one on fire. His body burned away, but he somehow came back to life. They then blinded Sasuke so he couldn't do it anymore. Itachi looked up at Sasuke with eyes full of sorrow. He didn't say a word. He simply undid the chains and pulled him down. Oh, what do we have here? A voice said from behind. Itachi turned back to see the form of Hizashi Hyuga. What have you done to my brother and why? Itachi demanded. Hizashi stood there. We took your brothers because they were the key to something powerful, something important. Through them, the Ten Saigon could be awakened, and now we'll use them to bring true peace. Peace, Itachi asked. Hizashi nodded. So long as Shinobi exist, peace will remain out of our grasp. Through the power of the Ten Saigon, we will destroy the warring Shinobi villages. We'll eradicate the cancer of war before it can spread. Itachi was appalled by this. The concept of creating peace by destroying those who were the only ones capable of experiencing it? To that, Itachi's eyes switched to Mongekyo. Naruto was surprised. Itachi, when did you... how? Itachi looked over. Quite a while ago. How doesn't matter. All that matters is that I have them. Keep Sasuke safe. I'll deal with this man. 
Itachi would then rush at Hizashi, striking out at him. Hizashi was surprised that a boy like Itachi had the strength that he did. It was astounding. Itachi would flip over Hizashi and then weave his hand signs, forming the Great Fireball Jutsu. He would launch it at the man. Hizashi would jump over it, just as Itachi had expected. He then cast a Matarasu, setting the man ablaze. The flames began to burn Hizashi to ashes. Itachi took a deep breath, attempting to calm down. However, rising from the ashes, Hizashi stood. It'll take more than that to defeat me, he said. Itachi looked back. What are you? Itachi asked. Hizashi answered that simply, immortal. Realizing this, Itachi knew that he had no choice but to use that. It was strenuous, but it was their only chance. Itachi would summon his Susanoo to protect him. The Susanoo would cover his body, protecting him from attack, but that's not all it was meant for. The Susanoo pulled the blade of Tatsuka. Immortal or not, you will not walk away from this battle. He would strike Hizashi with the blade of Tatsuka and would seal him away. Itachi would then fall to his knees, coughing. Naruto would race over to him, holding Sasuke's hand. The two of them would reach out to Itachi. Are you okay? Naruto asked. Itachi would spit, blood present in his saliva. I'll be fine. Let's get out of here. He would stand and begin to race out with Naruto and Sasuke. Together, they would flee into the cave and return to Earth. Finally safe, they'd begin their trek home. What did they do to you? Itachi asked Naruto. They took our chakra. Why? Itachi asked. To awaken some new kind of Byakugan. They wanted to use it to drop the moon on top of Konoha. Together, they walked for quite some time, and as they did, they would notice Itachi's breathing becoming more noticeable and labored. Are you okay? Naruto asked. Itachi nodded. Y yeah, I think... I think I just have a fever. We need to get back home, soon. Naruto stepped forward and stopped. He tied a rope around his waist and then the other end around Sasuke's. He then stepped in front of Itachi. Get on, he said. Itachi looked away, embarrassed. No, I can't have you do that. Naruto looked back. You came all this way after us. The least I can do is carry you back. Now get on. I'm not asking you again. Itachi reluctantly climbed onto Naruto's back. Together, the three brothers made their way back in Konoha's direction. However, before they got there, they were stopped by Neji. What did you do to my father? He demanded, looking down on them, his eyes displaying the regal glow of the Tensaigon. Naruto looked up at him. What we had to. He's gone. We can't let you do this. Neji grit his teeth and I can't afford to let you stop me. Naruto gave a bit of a sigh. I won't let you stand in our way. Neji's intense eyes narrowed. Likewise. Naruto rushed at Neji, whose attacks and defenses were on a whole other level. Naruto did, to his credit, have resistance to the gentle fist technique due to his tailed beast, but beyond that, there wasn't much he could do against Neji. Not when Neji was far older and more experienced. In the end, Naruto was knocked back by him. As he laid there, Itachi stood. He stepped in front of Naruto and Sasuke, ready to defend them. Neji laughed. And what do you hope to do that he couldn't? Itachi smiled. Win. And with that, the two of them launched into an intense battle, to which Neji found himself surprised. Itachi was on a whole other level compared to Naruto. He was quicker, more agile, and his perception was only further increased by his Sharingan. Neji actually felt himself being pushed back a bit. But with all things being considered, Neji was still superior to Itachi with Taijutsu. The ninjutsu and abilities of his Mangekyo Sharingan, while strong, were not quite enough to stop Neji. Neji ended up knocking Itachi back. Itachi rolled along the ground. He gasped as he came to one knee. Naruto and Sasuke were behind him. Naruto managed to sit up. Itachi looked back. Naruto. Sasuke. The only way for me to have a chance is if you give me your power, please. Naruto would nod. All right. He would put his hand on Itachi's back, as would Sasuke. They would begin to flow their chakra into Itachi. Itachi felt it entering his body, flowing together, mixing with his chakra. Suddenly, he felt something awaken. His eyes opened and displayed the Rinnegan in both. He was surprised by this increase in power, but furthermore, he felt the chakra swirling and intensifying, mixing with his tailed beast chakra. Suddenly, Itachi burst into a chakra mode, truth seeker orbs hovering behind him. Neji stood there and sneered. He knew that Itachi had just awakened the same power he had. Neji would then enter his Tensaigon chakra mode. Itachi and Neji would then resume their battle. They moved through the air so quickly that they couldn't even be seen, only heard. With each strike, with each movement, they broke the sound barrier. Naruto could only look on in surprise as Itachi and Neji faced off. 
Itachi would rush at Neji with a strike. Neji would utilize his palm rotation to defend himself. Eventually, Itachi ran out of breath and the jutsu came to an end. Neji would be seen walking through the charred remains of trees. He would fire it at Itachi, who would summon his Susano and defend with the Yada Mirror. The blast, however, was so powerful that it completely shattered both, causing Itachi to go rolling. Itachi came to a stop and rose to his knees. He was steaming from the attack, and it was obvious that he was at his limit. It was then that Neji formed the Sword of Nonoboko and approached Itachi to finish it off. In another life, in another place, you would be standing where I am now, proclaiming that death brings peace. But unlike you, I will not fall. He would raise his blade to strike Itachi down. He then swings the blade. Itachi quickly rolls forward and forms a spear from a Truth Seeker orb and plunges it into Neji's chest, piercing his heart, pinning him to a tree. Neji is startled. Itachi stands there and coughs into his elbow, his eyes displaying grogginess. Perhaps you're right, he said. In that world, I don't doubt that I would be standing where you are. I've had the same thoughts. Would the world not be better off without Shinobi? But at the same time, people are free to choose their path. What will be will be, and we can't stop it. Even if we ended war one day, it would return again the next. You can't change human nature. You can't destroy who we are without destroying us. Allow me to demonstrate. He turned around and walked away. And as he did, the Truth Seeker Orb Spear detonated, taking Neji along with it. Itachi continued to walk out of the forest and onto the road, where Naruto and Sasuke were waiting. His form would come to an end. Did you do it? Sasuke asked. Itachi would raise a thumb, no longer caring if Sasuke could see it. It was all he had the strength to do before his legs went out from under him. Itachi! Naruto raced to his side. He turned him over. We need to get him to Konoha, fast! He loaded up Itachi on his back and tied the rope around his waist again. Naruto began to lead them back to the village. All the while, he felt the wet warmth of blood against his back. Please, hold on Itachi. Please hold on. Fugaku sat in his office, kicking some poor trash can out of shape and then back into shape only to kick it out of shape once more. He was frustrated, unable to find Sasuke or Naruto, and now he had lost Itachi too. He felt like a total failure. He sat at his desk, seething. It was then that a shinobi walked in. Sir, they've returned. Fugaku sat up. What? The shinobi continued. Your sons. All three have returned, but you need to hurry to the hospital. They're in bad shape. Fugaku stood immediately and made his way out the door and into the streets. He raced through the village, past the townsfolk with such speed that you might think he was the leaf's yellow flash returned to life. Racing to the hospital, he stepped to the front desk to ask for room numbers before making his way up the stairs. He was met there by his wife, Makoto, the only person who could have made it any quicker than he. What's happening? Are they all okay? Makoto looked back. They're being checked out now. Naruto seems to be fine. Sasuke, he was blinded. Fugaku nearly put his fist through the wall. And what of Itachi? Makoto stood there for a moment. He was unconscious when he was brought back to the village and he was drooling a bloody froth. Tsunade's in there with him now. Fugaku dropped to his knees, his head against the wall. Makoto walked over to him and wrapped her arms around him. Eventually, Tsunade stepped out. Makoto and Fugaku looked up at her. Please, please tell me he's okay. She took a deep breath. He overexerted himself pretty badly. The damage to his lungs, the cancer, it... She stood there for a moment. I don't think there's anything I can do for him. I don't think he'll make it through the night. Fugaku broke down into tears along with Makoto. Tsunade looked away from them. She grit her teeth. I'm sorry, she squeaked under a clearing of her throat as she walked away. Fugaku and Makoto stepped into the room where their son was. He was laying in the bed, seemingly unconscious. He just looked so tired. He had fought so hard, and now? Now he was ready to rest. Fugaku and Makoto took a seat, each on either side of him. They took his hands, hoping to get his attention. Itachi opened his eyes just barely and looked at them. Mom, Dad, he whispered. They grew close. We're here. Itachi looked at them both. I brought them home, he said. Fugaku bit his lip as tears raced down his cheeks. He nodded. Yes, son, you did. I couldn't be more proud. Makoto just kissed the back of his hand. Unsure what more to do than that, it was a mother's instinct. He lay there silently for a moment. Sasuke, he's blind. Fugaku nodded. It's not your fault. Itachi looked at Fugaku. Give him my Sharingan. Fugaku clenched his teeth so tightly that one of his molars split in two. Blood began pooling in his mouth. Itachi. Itachi lay there, fighting for each breath. Papa. Mama. I'm tired. Can I sleep? Fugaku had to be careful not to squeeze Itachi's hand too tightly as he could hardly keep himself composed. 
Makoto had lost composure. Fugaku nodded. Yes, you've done so well. I'm so proud of you. If you feel the need to rest now, you can rest. We're, we're going to be okay. Because of you, we're going to be okay. Itachi took a breath that almost sounded like a sigh. He closed his eyes. His breathing quickened for a moment, and then it stopped. Makoto and Fugaku cried. A week later, as Fugaku stood there above the grave, no father should ever have to bury their son, he said. Hiruzen placed a hand on his shoulder. That phrase is one I spoke at the end of every funeral during the Second and Third World Wars. He was a fighter. He fought valiantly. He was the embodiment of the will of fire. Fugaku looked down to Hiruzen with tears in his eyes. Does it get easier? Hiruzen had tears in his own eyes. The pain dulls with time, but it will always be a part of you. And from my experience, even though the memories bring me pain, if I had the choice right now to forget, I would choose to remember. He pat Fugaku's shoulder and moved on. Fugaku looked down at Sasuke. Sasuke looked up at his father, his eyes bearing the light of his soul through the windows Itachi had given him. Looking into these eyes, he saw both Sasuke and Itachi looking back. He lifted his son up into his arms and held him there, offering a kiss to his cheek. Fugaku looked down at Naruto and placed a hand on his head before kneeling down to embrace him as well. I love you two. And life moved on. It didn't stop for anyone. The hands of time continued to spin and the days passed into weeks, weeks into months and months into years. The pain had dulled, leaving memories bittersweet. But every time he looked into the mirror, Sasuke saw Itachi looking back at him and he could have sworn that he witnessed a smile play upon his lips. As the years passed on, Hanabi would grow into a fine young woman, and she would marry and give birth to children, and those children would eventually grow and give birth to children of their own. The generations passed, and the Hyuga eventually returned to their full number, but things had changed. The elders learned from their mistakes and refused to allow the same to occur again. Even if their Byakugan was stolen, it didn't matter so long as they had family and due to the bonds of love, the Hyuga became stronger than ever. And that's the end of our story. As I write this, I'm wiping away tears. I've not been affected by anything I've written quite like this, but this was the way of things, I suppose. Itachi's death was something that was important to the canon, and though we loved him, we gotta let him go. But, you know, now that I've made what could be the absolute saddest video pertaining to Itachi known to mankind, it frees me up to write perhaps the happiest video pertaining to Itachi known to mankind. I promise, I won't leave you here to suffer with this. I hope to see you there. Until then, peace out. Did you enjoy our video? Well, then be sure to check out these other great videos from the Amagi. And make sure to subscribe and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos.